And I have no conflict of interest. I've come with pleasure to talk to you, and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, I was asked to have some learning objectives, and um, I usually like to make my talks somewhat informal, but I did have to have some learning objectives. So here you go. I hope that um, this talk will um, make you get to the importance of global mental health for maintaining mental health in brain tumor survivors. Um, also, I hope that you will consider the risk of mental health in brain tumor survivors. And I hope that we can address some of the issues of how to maintain mental health and how to prevent mental health survivors um, in brain tumors. Now, this is a very busy picture, and I stress the word global, global health and global mental health. Is that better? Does that sound better? OK, sorry about that. Um, this picture is meant to give you a general idea of what we know in terms of the impact of having a brain tumor. Um, having Christy talk about her pers uh, personal experience was wonderful because it gives you a real person, a whole person. And uh, we know that the older the individual is when they are um, diagnosed with a brain tumor, the better the outcomes. So it is very important that we have her sharing our uh, story because it's not my intent to put a damp or to make less uh, less hopeful of a picture. But on the other hand, we also need to have a general picture and more realistic. And you will then um, consider, and later on we will have um, a, a physician, a, a neuro-oncologist, who will talk further about some of the more general issues. But as we know, um, a brain cancer can have an impact on the entire individual. And uh, from my perspective, the neurocognition and psychosocial issues and mental health are the ones that I will be focusing. But other areas, clearly all the physical impact of the brain uh, in many different organs, cardiovascular, uh, fertility, um, a sensory neuro, uh, neurosensory um, uh, impairments, um, vision, hearing, and so on, will have a major health impact, but it will also have a major impact on mental health. And we will go back to this picture, but I wanted to give the idea of um, the overall um, health of the individual. Now, general information about brain tumors. In children, we know that 70% of the kids that are diagnosed with brain tumors will survive beyond five years post-diagnosis. We also know that the majority of pediatric brain tumor survivors reach adulthood. And um, this is something wonderful. But at the same time, it presents challenges for them to live a healthy, normal life and to achieve their dreams. Um, we also know that brain tumor survivors have the highest rate of chronic health conditions. Um, most brain tumor survivors experience multiple late effects. And as the previous figures show, endocrinology dysfunction is one major problem depending on where the brain tumor was located in the brain. Uh, Neurological and sensory impairments, such as mentioned, cardiovascular, secondary malignancies, they are a higher risk for that. And the areas I have put um, highlighted are the areas that I will focus today. The neurocognitive deficits that we know, particularly in what we call 
executive functions. And I will talk a little bit more about that, which encompass attention, information, processing, and working memory. Um, so what do I mean by attention? I mean by being able to focus specifically on what you are seeing, perceiving, and giving your full um, so that you can actually get the information. And often, especially in large, in large groups, it is very difficult to focus because there's very many stimuli that are competing for attention. Uh, so, information processing. Clearly, what we understand by information processing is being able to um, perceive and process throughout the um, secondary to primary brain functions so that we can actually comprehend what we are experiencing. And um, we find that in terms of information processing, speed of information processing is often impacted when you have brain tumors. Working memory. Working memory is exactly what it means. What do we need to be present at the moment to be able to relate with people, to be able to learn, to be able to engage in a conversation and retrieve past memories that may be relevant to the present moment. That is why it's called working memory. Those are areas that are often found to be impaired when individuals are um, treated for a brain tumor. Now, in terms of the social competencies, this is another big umbrella, and it is critical in mental health for individuals. Um, making friends, feeling isolated, being bullied, um, having difficulties finding employment, um, having difficulties in developing romantic relationships, living with a partner or living independent are general areas that had been found. Individuals who are treated for brain tumors usually have difficulties. And of course, this is in general. We're talking about average general information, not the specific individual. Uh, in terms of education and vocational difficulties, we also have found that um, the, uh, uh, finishing college of university or higher education sometimes cannot be achieved when you have a brain tumor. Christine, I am so happy that you have been able, I'm very, uh, I congratulate you, I'm not sure where you are right now, for uh, uh, being able to go back to school and uh, continue with your master's studies. So that is amazing. And um, like I said earlier, um, Unfortunately, the younger the individual, uh, the less likely that that could happen. Uh, so, um, although this was a horrible experience, but uh, being 22 years of age uh, uh, when your uh, tumor was found um, was a blessing. Yeah. Um, so, um, mental health. This is the reason I'm here for. You notice I put depression in parentheses and question mark. Um, and I don't want to give everything now, but um, what I said earlier, it, it, it does apply. It, depression is what we have found the most, and I will address that in a minute. Now, I already talked a little bit about the neurocognitive uh, uh, difficulties in brain tumor, and you probably are thinking, why is she talking about all this, okay? This is the reason why, what I said earlier, the whole individual. Uh, how we are able to process information will impact on how we feel about ourselves, whether or not we begin to develop some symptoms of mental health problems. Okay, so uh, having neurocognitive problems are considered to be high risk for mental illness, any kind of mental illness. Uh, some um, 
uh, mental illnesses are temporary, for, for example, delirium. If any of you have ever taken prednisone, we do know that one of the side, major side effects um, of prednisone will be psychotic reactions, specifically delirium. Fortunately, this uh, is a temporary reaction. But in general, some depression symptoms had been found in children, in adolescents, and adults. It doesn't mean that all of the individuals that show the symptoms will develop a major depression disorder. So there are um, levels in which, when we look at mental health, we all have the continue at any point in our life. We may hit the top for symptoms of depression, but that doesn't mean that you have a major depression disorder. Okay, so when we have catastrophes, when we have tragics, when you have um, traumatic experiences, we may be for a week uh, melancholic and so on and so forth, but we go back to be our normal selves. So long as our function, our daily function, functioning is not impaired for more than a month, that you don't want to get out of bed, you don't want to shower, you don't want to do anything, just lying on the couch, watching movies 24-7, for three, four weeks, major problem. But if it is for a few days, from uh, about a week, and then you say, okay, enough of feeling sorry for myself, okay, let, take a shower, go for a run, and let's go on with life. Okay, suck it up. So there are differences. Um, so I think you get the picture here. Um, now, social competencies. How do we define social competencies? Any actions of any behavior that engage another human being. Looking at each other smiling, chatting, doing things together, fighting a social behavior too, uh, arguing, being in a group is so important. All of that is social behavior. And in my experience working clinically and as a researcher with children, social behavior, social competencies are so impacted with children, particularly with children who are going on, as Kristen was going on with her life and um, uh, in her nursing career, and all the a certain bang with a diagnosis. What it happened to children, a 10, they are a typical child, and all of a certain they don't go to school, uh, they have to be in hospital for prolonged periods of time. They have to have scary procedures, getting into a, a machine that is scary, and you have to be immobile, not moving for a long period of time. All those exp scary experiences uh, do change kids. Sometimes it's only temporary. Sometimes it may escalate with other experiences because when they are away from their typical environment like school or employment, etc., cetera, uh, they disengage, they become isolated and it's hard to get back into the group. So social competency is very, very important. We have found that in, in adults, for example, um, uh, survivors of brain tumors are highly represented in terms of five times um, reporting unemployment uh, uh, as likely that the controls and twice as likely that their own siblings, and those are in, in studies when they have asked them, uh, the uh, survivors of brain tumors are more likely to never get married 
And a lot of the reasons for that, again, go, goes back to the side effects and the physical late effects that they have. It could be mobility, it could be vision, hearing, it could be neurocognitive difficulties that they have. It could be um, social problems, or it could be mental health, like social phobias is something that we do see more, and it is associated with a lot of the isolation and not feeling that they belong to a group. Um, so uh, in my own work um, uh, in a survival study that we did of, um, a, a number of years ago, uh, when we asked the survivors and compared them with other individuals with other cancers, those survivors of brain tumors reported to have less friends, especially less closer friends, the ones that they can confide, they can share their more intimate feelings and thoughts um, that other survivors. Um, so all of those issues are going to have an impact on mental health. There was a very large study that it was initiated in the US. It was called the, um, the Childhood Cancer uh, Survival Study, uh, which began in, the 19, in 1999, approximately that um, in those years. It, it involved many, many, many centers in the US and a couple of centers in Canada. Um, Today, they have published more than 300 papers on the results of this large study. Um, of the many survivors of many uh, childhood cancer, the survivors of brain tumors particularly presented with some risk or some difficulties. And uh, a colleague of mine, Zebra, Brad Zebra, took the time to select the group of brain tumor survivors and trying to find out what was the mental health on a sample that over 20,000 survivors, okay? Um, the brain tumor survivors, the sample was um, a little bit over 300 uh, survivors. So what they found, it was higher rate of depression and global and somatic distress higher than their siblings. Uh, they also found uh, lower scores and measures of health-related quality of life. Quality of life includes, uh, is a, a multi-domain um, term or construct that we use, and it, it, it involves physical um, a, domains, social, emotional, cognitive, all together asking the individuals how are they dealing with uh, areas uh, like that and whether they feel that the life is um, uh, satisfactory to them and whether they have quality in their life or not. And in general, uh, the survivors of brain tumors report lower quality of life. Um, it, Depression symptoms were also higher, as I indicated. And, but the most important thing is that they also look what were the factors that will place a survivor at risk for mental health, particularly for depression. Being a female. We know in the general population that being a female is also a risk for depression. Um, no matter where you look at it, no matter what country you look at it, no matter what age you look at it, you will always find more symptoms of depression in females than males. So that's also true for brain tumor survivors. Coming from uh, poor families, where resources, financial, and other practical resources are limited also is considered a risk factor. Lower education attainment. This is almost a cash 22. If you have impairments, neurocognitive impair impairments of the type that I um, described earlier, then it will be difficult then to, um, 
to achieve highly educationally, particularly after high school. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, the younger the children, the more likely that they will be impaired and more difficult it will be to achieve high education uh, attainment. Um, being unmarried is also a risk factor. Being unemployed for the last 12 months is also a risk factor. But the most critical factor of all is poor physical health. Many survivors and you as caregivers or as survivors or as friends or healthcare providers know of the many the, the different physical disabilities or impairments that go along with being a survivor. So again, I want to put this forward. Oh, excuse me, I, I jumped the most important part. <laughs> from my perspective anyways, because this is my own research. Um, very few people have looked at mental health of uh, survivors of brain tumors, and in children specifically, <clears throat> we have made an effort to look at what is it? Not just the neurocognitive, not just the social, which is a strong area of research of mine, <clears throat> but also the areas of mental health. <clears throat> and in my own research, um, one of my early studies that we look at whether there were symptoms of mental health problems, particularly depression and anxiety, and we did find elevated um, symptoms of depression, but not high clinical depression, as I explained earlier. <clears throat> but we also found a very interesting correlation, association between having symptoms of depression and low self-esteem. If you have high self-esteem, there will be low symptoms of depression, but vice versa. And again, we found the correlation, which you already know, with gender, higher in females, particularly if those females have low self-esteem. <clears throat> then more recently, uh, in a larger study looking at social competency, we also look at areas of mental health and depression and anxiety were the two that we are looking more closely. And of course, um, we did find that depression symptoms were highly associated with social skills. And social skills, having good social skills and having low depression symptoms or no clinical depression will predict how your peers nominate you. And this is a very critical finding because we actually ask peers in classrooms to select their friends. They did not know that we were there because there was a child with brain tumor. This is very important. We asked them to select who are their best friends. And we also look the reciprocal selection of best friends. And what we found, very sadly, approximately 50% of the kids with brain tumor have zero friends that, were, uh, that nominated them as their friend. And reciprocal friendships was also very low. So this is very important because when we talk about relating with others, a child spends the majority of the daytime in a classroom with friends. And when they have been separated from uh, their friends from a period of time, they lose they lose some of the connections and it's harder to get back into the group, particularly if when they go back, they may have some signs, some scars, or they have lost their hair. Kids can be cruel. They, uh, the survivors, the kids, when they go back, they could experience bullying and they could also experience simply not being included in the group. And that creates also a, a, a sense on the individual, I'm not wanted, and the, the child himself begins to 
withdraw from the group. So it's, it's a cash 22. If they feel that they're not wanted, they are not going to attempt to be friendly. So in the social skills groups that we have uh, offered at SickKids and that we have tested whether or not those groups are beneficial to children, we have found that kids often they forget how to be a friend and instead of making eye contact with other people, they keep their eyes down. Instead of saying hi when somebody says hi, say hi back, they don't. Or they say hi like this. So what we teach them is how to make friends again, how to to, to make friends, you need to learn to be a friend and how to gain more confidence in your own skills so that they can then go on from now. Because, like I said, it's a cash 22. They feel they don't want it, and then they themselves withdraw from the social environment. Um, we also found needless to say, that um, anxiety and depression symptoms were highly associated with social skills. Um, and finally, in, in the most recent analysis that we have done, we have found that um, social competency in general, but when we look specifically at some areas of social skills, like being able to assert yourself, to say, excuse me, that is my pencil. Excuse me, this is my lunch. You are not to take my lunch away from me. Um, those kinds of skills are highly associated with anxiety and depression. And again, it, there is a lot more to be done. But what we can say is that a brain tumor in himself will not cause mental illness. But everything else that is associated with the physical impairments, the social isolation, the neurocognitive impairments that may or may not come may contribute to the development of poor mental health. So, we are almost done. Um, what can we do to prevent uh, the development of mental health and to what can we provide in terms of supportive interventions? First of all, I cannot stress enough the importance of monitoring and following up, not only for the physical signs, but for mental and social signs. Regular in most centers, they do have follow-ups initially, um, maybe three months, six months, once a year. It is very important to monitor. And if it is necessary, if symptoms are found, clearly interventions are called for. Maintaining physical health. It is important to every single individual, whether you, have, you are a survivor or not, to be responsible for your own physical and mental health. Um, if you are a survivor, it is essential. Improve social opportunities for interacting with peers, with friends, with family, uh, and effort. Organizations like this ones are wonderful because it provides a natural, supportive environment in which you can network. And um, uh, the introductions that were made uh, earlier encourage that kind of networking. And this is terribly important. It's a prevented for mental health, but it's also supporting good health. Uh, improve educational and vocational attainment and the opportunities. Um, clearly, uh, when an individual has some impairments, they need to be identified, and then a program, educational plan, needs to be tailored to those needs. There is no reason why a child with a brain tumor should not 
continue the education and graduate from high school and then go on to find whether it's a vocational um, a profession, anything, so that they can become self-sufficient and independent and feel um, a confidence in their own skills, whatever those skills may be. But it's essential that we provide the opportunities for them to develop their maximum potential in every area of their growth and development. And I mentioned here only a few. Um, earlier it was mentioned, and I don't need to mention now, but the internet in the web, they are uh, many, many, many resources. And I decided not to put them in here because the organization is fantastic in terms of providing you with that kind of information. Um, the, also, George Brown College is associated with the SAFTI program, which some of you may be, uh, uh, in fact, I hope that all of you are informed about these programs. And if you are not, I'd be happy to provide you with more information uh, later on. Maintaining mental health, that I mean improving self-confidence, uh, learn, learn how to manage stress. Um, there are many, many programs uh, that do help individuals teach them how to uh, reduce the stress level. Mindfulness is so popular, and if you check on the web, and I'm pretty sure the, um, 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 the, uh, the uh, join the movement have some links with mindfulness groups as well. But self-care, uh, self-identity, independence, competency, self-confidence, self-love, and self-acceptance are very, very critical. And finally, develop your own values of yourself, Regardless, we are all special. We don't need to be like each other, but we need to learn to love ourselves so that we can love others. We have to learn to respect ourselves so that we can expect respect from others. And so on and so forth. Dignity, you need to feel that no matter how competent you are in X, Y, and Z, you are a human being, and you need to respect your own identity. If we compare with others, we always going to feel, we all do, I am not as good as, I could be doing better, and so on and so forth. So forth. I encourage you, all of you say, I am who I am, I am good enough, and I'm going to do my best. And with that, I will stop before my time is over so that we can have some time for questions. Okay. Thank you so much. So we do have some time.